This episode is brought to you by Bank of America. From a local business to a global corporation, partnering with Bank of America gives your operation access to exclusive digital tools, award-winning insights, and business solutions so powerful you'll make every move matter. Visit bankofamerica.com slash bankingforbusiness to learn more. What would you like the power to do? Bank of America N.A. Copyright 2023. Hello and welcome to another episode of Working Overtime, the bi-weekly advice focus the good fight to working's the good wife, only slightly less gone so. I'm your host, June Thomas. And I'm your other host, Karen Hahn. Hey Karen, how are you today? I'm good. So I watched some of The Good Wife, but <laughs> I never got around to watching The Good Fight. But are, are you Christine Baranski? Totally. Who am I? <laughs> you are Kush Jumbo. Ooh, okay. And she's amazing. So yeah, fantastic. That's who you are. Cool. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> okay. So besides The Good Fight, which obviously it seems like we would recommend, uh, like, sure. although again, I haven't seen it, but I've only heard good things. <laughs> what are we talking about for our episode today? So I want to talk about the concept of showing your work. Uh, the idea is popular in, to use a very ugly term, the productivity space. <laughs> Uh, where it's often called working with the garage door open. But I am very fond of the work of Austin Cleon, who was a guest on Working back in 2021. He spoke with Ruman, and he has a whole book called Show Your Work, which I recently reread, and that made me want to revisit some of his ideas here on Working Overtime. Mm -hmm. Before we get into it, is this idea of sharing your work something that's part of your creative process generally? I think the idea of it definitely is, but in practice, mm. maybe a little less so. We've talked about this before, but I can get precious about what I'm doing in terms of not wanting to show someone something that I don't really like yet. Yeah, But yeah. probably more because for a long time, I was working by myself and what I would send to an editor would be in a state that I was okay with. That said, working with a partner means that I do inherently have to show my work a little more because we're working together from the inception of a project yeah. and working at the kinks as a team. I also want to say I'm a fan of the concept because I find it tremendously helpful or at least just reassuring to see what other people are doing through sharing their work. Yeah, totally. And that's really what kind of convinced me of its worth because mm -hmm. it's really helpful for me to see other people's work in progress and yeah. kind of their process and how things change and improve. And that makes me want to do it even though, yeah, I feel a little self-conscious about that. It's almost like being influenced in a way. <laughs> it's like they're productivity influencers where you see this and you're like, ooh, maybe I'll try that trick and that's going to unlock all the doors for me. Totally. Yeah, we're all looking for that one thing, right? That's mm -hmm. going to turn a switch and yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> and, you know, it, we act like this is something really strange and, and unusual, but you know, the truth is anyone who in recent years is many of us who spent time trying to craft an absolute banger of a tweet <laughs> has done something like this, you know, in yeah. recent years. I think Twitter has been the main venue where people, but especially journalists, writers, comedians and other creative people have shown the world their wit, their intellect, their ideas. You know, our working co-host Isaac Butler often talks about how he's gotten jobs and built important friendships and relationships, and just generally gotten a lot of juice from putting his ideas and his very funny jokes and mm -hmm. very serious ideas sometimes out on Twitter. And it's a way of kind of displaying your taste and the things you're noodling, just putting them out there and where other people can interact with them mm -hmm. and also maybe help you develop them. Karen, you are fantastic on Twitter. Have you ever had a conscious philosophy of tweeting, you know, with goals about what you were trying to get out of it? Well, first of all, that's very, very kind of you to say. <laughs> and second, I don't think I've ever sat down and prescribed myself a philosophy as far as tweeting goes. <laughs> and I think I generally shoot from the hip when I tweet. I'm just like, yeah, yeah. that's like a tweet. I'm going to tweet it out. But I do know that very early on, I sort of figured out that there wasn't a lot of point in my tweeting out negative energy, if that makes sense. I mean this in a pretty mm. inconsequential way. Like, I won't tweet out, like, this movie sucks, I hate this actor, whereas I do and would tweet against discriminatory laws and things like that. Right. But if I'm not tweeting about my work, then I'm not really trying to get anything out of it anymore, at least, other than sort of just chatting with my friends. And I definitely structure my tweets about my work, like if I was 
tweeting out a link to an article or something differently than a joke or something like that. Yeah, totally. You know, we, we are professionals after all. Yes, we can't exactly. Help ourselves. <laughs> a professional. <laughs> I don't know if you did anything like this for your book about Bong Joon-ho, Dissident Cinema. Just a little bit after I signed my book contract, mm -hmm. I started a free newsletter. And, you know, the idea behind it was to share ideas and interest in things that I came across in the course of my research. But I have to admit that my main motivation was probably just having an excuse to write. You know, at that point, I'd been podcasting for a while. I hadn't been doing much kind of regular writing. And I just was craving a reason to just sit down and like bang out a thousand words on a mm -hmm. topic of my choosing. You know, if if it had some positive side effects like promoting the book or building a mailing list, that was great. But that wasn't why I was doing it. What I really wanted from the newsletter was an excuse to, you know, step out of my book writing process, which, you know, has a very long lead time and just work on writing something that I could just send out into the world, you know, seconds <laughs> after I'd finished it. And I, you know, I didn't spend much, if any, effort on getting more subscribers. So it's mostly my friends or people who are really, really interested in lesbian culture and history, which is the subject of the book. But in addition to forcing me to write now and again, which was really useful, I really did receive good, very useful feedback from people. Wow. So there was that practical benefit. But I would also often just get responses to saying, this is interesting, I can't wait to read the book. And those responses were pretty motivational and they <laughs> kind of reassured me, you know, that I wasn't the only person who found these weird archival discoveries or odd coincidences fascinating. Yeah. Did you do anything like that? And if not, did you think about doing it? I didn't, but that's such a good idea. I, I think it didn't occur to me because I wasn't coming at writing my book from the same angle. For instance, I, mm. I had, I was not entrenched in podcasting prior to going into writing. Like I'd been writing and I was just going straight into another writing project and all the words that I could muster up on a given day, I wanted to put directly into the book. I was like, <laughs> I can't, I don't have <laughs> any more leeway than this, but I do sort of wish I had had that sense of community that you got from the feedback to your newsletter, which sounds really wonderful because I was so used to the me and an editor model that I didn't even really think about it. And, and there were definitely times in the writing of it where I was like, oh, my God, is anyone going to read this? Is this good? Like, of course, I trusted my editor, but having more yeah. voices telling you that you're doing a good job never hurts. Yeah, it's funny. We're professionals, <laughs> but it can be just reassuring. Everybody just likes yeah. that feeling of like, yeah, this is interesting. Yeah. Keep going. OK, we're going to take a short break. But when we return, we really will talk about the ideas in Austin Cleon's book, Show Your Work. This episode is brought to you by Bank of America. If you own or operate a business, whether it's a local operation or a global corporation, partnering with Bank of America could be your smartest move. By teaming with Bank of America, you'll enjoy exclusive digital tools, award-winning insights, and business solutions so powerful, you'll make every move matter. Position your business to capitalize on opportunity in a moment's notice. Visit bankofamerica.com slash bankingforbusiness to learn more. What would you like the power to do? Bank of America N.A. Copyright 2023. This episode is brought to you by SAP. Welcome to the window, the window of opportunity. When your next move can either make your business famous or obsolete. So you need to be ready. B. Handling good surprises and bad ones ready. B. Opening a Portland, Houston and Providence location on the same day ready. B. Stock options plus paid family leave ready. SAP has been there and can help you be ready for anything that happens next. Because it will. Be ready with SAP. Hello, listeners. Is there a particular creative struggle you would like to hear us tackle? Let us know by emailing us at working at slate.com or even better, you can call us and leave a message at 304-933-9675. That's 304-933-WORK. So at the beginning of Show Your Work, Austin Cleon says that one of the things that people always ask him about is getting discovered. Uh, he quotes Honoré de Balzac, who said, for artists, the great problem to solve is how to get oneself noticed. 
And, you know, it's easy to be negative or self-conscious about shameless self-promotion. But if you are putting energy and time and thought into a project and you're proud of it, or you want to get better at it, it's absolutely natural to really want people to see it so they can respond. And, you know, yeah, maybe that will benefit you in a tangible way. Maybe it will lead to you getting some paid work, for example. But that is definitely not the only benefit you can get. And I, I just think all creative people want to find other creative people to talk with, vibe with, collaborate with. And one very effective way of doing that is to put your work out into the world. You know, these days it's really easy to start a blog, a newsletter, to publish on Medium, put out Instagram stories, TikToks, make YouTube videos, start a podcast. You know, it's just I'm kind of get out of breath, just, you know, with those top of mind things. And, you know, if you want to find like minded people to engage with your ideas, send those ideas out into the world. Yeah, starting a blog was literally how I began in film criticism. So I do highly recommend just like putting it out there. It's good to make something tangible that you can show to other people. And even beyond that, it's good practice to keep working at whatever you ultimately want to do, even if it's mm -hmm. not necessarily paying you back in the immediate moment. And if you're open about sharing what you're making, it'll inevitably attract a little attention, even if it's not as much as you were maybe hoping for when you do it. And then it'll maybe attract more later on down the line from like-minded folks, as you right. say. I guess the bottom line is you have to have something to show in order to be discovered because nothing comes from nothing. But at the same time, don't work solely because you want to be discovered. Does this make sense? Like you should still yeah. like what yeah. you're doing. Yeah. You should still like your work. Like if your goal is I'm doing this because I want to become famous, like maybe reassess. <laughs> Get thee to Instagram. <laughs> Austin Kleon encourages his readers to, quote, commit to learning in front of others. That helps with accountability, but that's not what he really emphasizes. For him, yes, yeah, just as you said, this process is about getting the reps, you know, getting better at what you're trying mm -hmm. to do and being discoverable. You know, he says at the beginning, you shouldn't be thinking about this for a career or making money from it. You should just focus on sharing what you're into and getting better at it and just kind of being sure that it really is mm -hmm, what you want mm -hmm. to do. You know, the other thing about that is when we're first learning something, we're probably pretty bad <laughs> at it. So, you know, he's not necessarily suggesting foregrounding the actual things that you're producing. Maybe it should be your methods and your processes. You know, he says, there's the artwork, the finished piece, and the artwork, all the day-to-day -day stuff that goes on behind the scenes, looking for inspiration, getting an idea, applying oil to canvas, etc. So he encourages people to write or Instagram or whatever about those processes and inspirations and the things they're learning rather than just putting the product up on a website and calling it done. Good idea? What do you think? I think it's definitely helpful to not just show other people what you're doing, but to help clear things up for yourself. Like sort of as you're saying, like making sure not only that this is something you want to do, but also like helping you to, while showing your work, figure out what you're really working on. Yeah. And it's also a lot less pressure than showing your own work specifically to talk about influences and yeah. stuff like that. That said, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to call something done and to show it off, especially if it's in combination with showing your process. And I think the flip side to this, I'd say at least, is that you can get mired down in the process if you start getting too in your head about that. And you can start overthinking and never get to a concrete goal or finish line. Yeah, that makes me think of two things. The first is that as somebody who is really almost certainly excessively into documentation, sometimes, you know, <laughs> I can just document a project and not actually do the project. Yeah. And then another thing is, I think it was Ira Glass who said something smart once about how creative people, they have a high taste level long before they get as good enough at something to feel really proud of mm. the actual product. So that's another reason that people could get into an overthinking loop like, ah, you know, I can look at this, I see, this is not, this is not what I'm going to make eventually. <laughs> and I don't know if I want people to judge me on this, but also I'm not going to get better. Yeah. But you're right. You can't only put your influences and inspirations out there. And again, Austin Cleon is very clear that you should always provide credit and attribution. Mm -hmm. This is not an excuse to just get clicks from other people's work. But 
there's one thing that I think we rarely talk about it. I know you have a background in art history, so maybe this is something you've spent more time on, but I think learning to talk about your work is an important part of the job of being an artist or any kind of creative person. So yeah, if you're a visual artist, it would help you to do well in a career if that's what you decide to do or is that what you want to do. If you have to learn to find ways of describing your process or getting people interested in what you're making, I often think that the, you know, the difference in success rates isn't necessarily about talent or the kind of the quality of the art. It's about the, how well people tell a story mm. about what they're making. For example, if you're wanting to write about a particular nonfiction topic, like movies or whatever, putting some of your thoughts on that subject out there in the world is going to be useful. Austin Cleon suggests, quote, sending out a daily dispatch. So every day publishing something about what you did that way. You know, and again, it doesn't have to be a thousand beautifully massaged words. It can be a tweet or an Instagram image. Uh, you know, it could be something small. But he says that's a much more effective advertisement for your ability than a resume because you're sharing what you're working on right now. You're showing how you think, how you develop ideas, how you make decisions. What do you think? Well, I think the one thing is that learning to talk about your work is really huge. I, I totally agree. Like, I think there is an avenue for people who, if that's not a part of your skill set or a toolkit, you'll still succeed if your art can really speak for itself. But whether or not that's true, learning to engage with people is a huge part of being in any field, really, not just creative. Yeah. Like. I remember there was something going around recently where it was like, yeah, your promotion isn't always just hinged on how well you work. It's also hinged on how well, how much people like you, which is a bit unfortunate, but still I'm not encouraging people to think about it that way, but just like yeah. in, in the same way that whenever we talk about the way that relationships inform your work and success on this show, it's always just use your common sense, like be nice to people. And in this particular instance, it's, I think we're talking about it more like learning how to pitch yourself, I guess, which yeah. is a very, yeah. very valuable skill. And I think something that you can get better at with just practice and not necessarily any innate skill at talking to people. Mm -hmm. And I think it could really be a good exercise to do this kind of daily dispatch if you want to. But I also think you should make sure it's something you really want to do rather than something you're viewing as an obligation. I don't think this method would necessarily work for everybody just because no method really does. And I think that when you have to start pitching projects to people who don't know you as well as, say, someone who already follows you on social media or someone who's friendly with you, then they're not always going to be looking at all of that documentation to get a sense of what you're capable of because they just don't yeah. have the time to. So in that instance, like having a resume like is maybe more helpful because I think the thing you put out into the world is ultimately the better barometer for what you're capable of, even if the process can be really helpful and informative. We'll be back with our final thoughts on this topic after this. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high yield savings account at 4.15% annual percentage yield. That's more than 10 times higher than the national average savings rate. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. National average savings rate is from FDIC website. Terms apply. Hello, listeners. I just want to remind you that if you are enjoying working overtime, please subscribe so that you never miss an episode. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, we would love for you to rate or review the show because it really does help new listeners to find us. And if Overcast is your app of choice, please hit the star to recommend the episode to others. All right, we're back. As you can probably tell, I'm pretty persuaded by Cleon's notions of sharing your work, even when you're still figuring things out. But there are definitely limits. And so I just want to spend a little bit of time on those. And I should note that he explicitly addresses some of those limits in the book. So let's talk about things it might be wise to hold back. First, obviously, if you are working on the kind of project that requires you to sign an NDA, or if you are asked by someone, you know, who you are working with to keep the project under your hat until a certain point, well, 
in those circumstances, do not even think about breaking <laughs> that kind of agreement. That would be very self-sabotaging. What else would hold you back, Karen? I think there are a few things. One, I want to make sure that there's still enough mystery so that people still want to see the final thing and don't feel like they get the whole picture from what I've shared already. Two, if I think an idea that I have is really novel and good and new, I don't really want to put it out there immediately for the sake of not spoiling it or otherwise having it yeah. kind of proliferated. I don't know like what stories I heard that made me this way, but I'm very protective of ideas. Like, there's a screenwriter that I follow on Twitter who has it in her pinned bio where she's like, do not send me unsolicited story ideas. Because if anything that yeah. I make after this is even close to it, even if, if you could somehow make an argument that it's close to it, then we're all in trouble. And it's just not really a good thing. But number three, maybe I'm just not totally happy with it yet to the point that I wouldn't sh want to show off my working it out process until it's a tad more polished. Those are my three things, I would say. Yeah, all, all very good points. It's tricky because I think you have to trust that if you get people interested in your work and in you, they're going to support you when the time comes by buying your book or going to see your play or whatever it is. But if there are surprises in the book, you really do not have to shout them from the rooftops mm -hmm. before the book comes out. In fact, you almost certainly shouldn't. No, I'm <laughs> going to say you, sh you definitely shouldn't. Also... This may seem basic, but don't lose sight of why you're doing this thing. Like, what is the purpose of the blog, newsletter, podcast, or whatever? If you were blogging in an attempt to get work, and then you get work, you might then need to focus on that work. I mean, everybody's time is limited, attention is limited. If you only have, say, 10 hours to work on something, and you have 10 hours of actual paying work to do, that's probably the thing you should focus on even if you don't like to miss a day of blogging or whatever. Mm -hmm. Don't let this sort of process thing that you're doing be a distraction from your biggest priority. Like keep your eyes on the price, I guess that boils mm -hmm. down to. No matter what you're doing, make sure you're doing it because you want to be doing it. <laughs> yes, yes. Hold on to your joy. That's yeah. our big message here on Working Overtime. All right. Well, that's all we have for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you have questions you'd like us to address, we really, really would love to hear from you. You can send us an email at working at slate.com or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK. If you'd like to support what we do, sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash working plus. You'll get bonus content, including exclusive episodes of Slow Burn and Big Mood Little Mood, and you'll be supporting what we do right here on Working. Big thanks to producer Kevin Bendis and to our series producer, Cameron Drews. Those two show their work every time they publish <laughs> an episode. We'll be back on Sunday with a brand new episode of Working, and in two weeks, we'll have another Working Overtime. Until then, get back to work. <laughs> Exploring ways to future proof your business? SAP can help. As the market leader in enterprise application software, SAP is helping companies of all sizes run better. They are redefining ERP and creating networks of intelligent enterprises that provide transparency and resilience across supply chains. Ready to learn more? Tune in to SAP Sapphire Virtual, their premier online event, May 16th to 17th. Their two-day live show offers insights into SAP solutions through the lens of customers, partners and thought leaders from around the globe. Take advantage of opportunities to brainstorm ideas, ask questions, and network with peers online. Learn how to future-proof your business and stay ahead of tomorrow today. Registration is free. Visit sap.com slash slate. That's sap.com slash slate. Hey, everybody. It's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids, and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, 
DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.